So as we sort of settle in, today we're going to talk about nutrients, the role of nutrients as they fuel food webs and ecosystems. And it kind of follows on a bit from what we talked about last time on, on Monday when we were talking about energetics and the, the factors which influence energetics. Now, but today we're specifically going to target different types of nutrients. Before we settle into it, um, so we may have noticed there's some updated things on our timetable for the next 15th of October, which is and the end of sort of my component of this course. This day week, we've got a revision for the raffle time slot. We're still pretty much on time in terms of the, the lecture, so that will definitely that will be over. But I want that to be kind of led by you. Um, I can put together some summary slides and things like that, and we will go through some of those examples of questions and things like that. But particularly, I want to get some feedback from you as to what you want me to talk about. Is there any aspect of the course that didn't quite resonate, didn't quite click? Um, and we've got some time that we can run through that then. Okay? Any questions? Oh, on that? No? Okay, so you can post stuff onto DTL, you can email me, you can do whatever works. So on, on Monday, we talked a lot about how fuel, food webs are fueled. We know that food webs are important, they sort of support. The, the communities that, that we're interested in, the communities that provide ecosystem services, that provide the, the, the food resources, at their, at their base, they're fueled by, by primary production, by photosynthesis. And we talked at some length about sort of the, the basic system through which this works, how energy is transferred from producers into consumers, and also tend to decomposers, and ultimately fuels complex food webs. We talked a bit about, and particularly here, we talked primarily from the perspective of light, temperature, water availability, how those things influence primary production, and how those things influence how energy is transferred through to higher trophic levels. We cover the concept of this net primary production. How so the amount of production minus the amount of respiration gives us the for the for synthesis of production minus respiration gives us this net primary productivity. And we can see theoretically, if I talk theoretically about why that should be influenced by by temperature, by by Planet and resource availability. And when we plot that out on small or very large spatial scales, we can see that that theoretic component falls through in the actual observations. So this sort of this is a plot of net primary productivity across the globe, highest in equatorial regions. Which have the most amount of light, the most amount of water, the most amount of heat. The other component that we didn't talk about very much in terms of productivity on, on Monday is the actual nutrient availability. And we're going to talk about that in detail here. And while, and first of all, why nutrients are important, and then how organisms obtain nutrients? How do nutrients cycle through a, through a food chain or through a food web? And we'll look at that across a, multi, a number of different types of ecosystems. The first thing I want to talk about is limiting factors. And we've got our usual sort of rolling gallery of old white dudes here to introduce us to the concept. 
and sort of chemists or physicists are kind of common, they're, they're hilarious people, and they have a common sort of saying that can physical laws are named after the per second person who discovered them. And we have the same thing in Colin, where what's termed Leibniz's law of the minimum was initially discovered by this fascinating old man, Carl Frege, and then rediscovered by Leibniz. And essentially what that's saying is that growth within a system, it could be a plant, it could be a whole population, is limited not by the total amount of resources, but by the scarcest resource. So whatever resource is, your, your, what growth will continue until one resource becomes available. If one not until that specific resource is added, then growth continues. So you could have a, a massive availability of sodium, sulfur, magnesium, manganese, cadmium. But if you don't have enough nitrogen, you can't grow if you're a plant. And this was the reason these guys are all, are all up here is because this was a, a really critical problem for human populations at the, remember at the turn of the last century. Because human populations were starting to grow, our agriculture was becoming more industrialized, but we had no way of adding nitrogen to the soil. Nitrogen was the limiting factor. Nitrogen is, as you'll see, a limiting factor in plant growth. And humans had no, we didn't have a, an easily available source of nitrogen to add to the soil. There's lots of sort of anecdotal stories about here, even here in New Brunswick, where amongst earlier mid, 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 mid sort of settler communities, that when the anadromous fishes, like salmon and alewife, things like that, when their run, those run spawning migrations would come up into the river, people would take them out in barrel loads, mash them up, and add them to the soil to, to get that nitrogen. Back and get some source of nit nitrogen into the soil. The last of our loads here, Fitzhaber, was had made, or he made a discovery that probably had the greatest change on human population growth is than any, any other in the last hundred years. He invented what's called the Haber Bosch process. And that's a way of an industrial method by which we can fix atmospheric nitrogen into biologically available ammonia, NH4. And that allowed us to create an abundance, or gave, gave us an abundant source of biologically available nitrogen that could be used as a fertilizer and add to fields. And that spawned what we see now. It's a, fundamental to what we see now in terms of massive industrial agriculture and the massive availability of food for for humans and for our for, for the animals that we that we also feed on. I talked a bit about one of the, the consequences of this. Because when these excess fertilizers, excess nitrogen is added to the soil, it's absorbed, but it's absorbed up to a point because we're still limited by the need growth. Growth will only then be limited by the availability of the next resource, which could be phosphorus or potassium. So all that excess nitrogen that's in the soil isn't being absorbed by plants, isn't being used, runs off the soil, it's very rapidly leaks out, gets into the water system and leads to the cultural eutrophication that we talked about previously. So yeah, if that was a little aside, it's probably worth noting that Haber's goal in this wasn't to promote agriculture. He was a he is and was a German in the time of the First World War, and they, the Germans didn't have access 
to nitrate to make munitions. The, the, the British and the, the, the Allies had access through, they were able to mine nitrate from, from South America, from Chile. But Haber, his research was, was funded and his goal was to get nitrate from munitions for, through the First World War and had catastrophic outcomes for, for, for humans. In the, in the natural world, there's <coughs> nitrogen is also is, is important, and there's systems through which nitrogen is cycled back up into plants. The, the nitrogen, nitrogen is an essential nutrient, an essential element for life. It's directly, it correlates almost directly one-to-one, -one, the amount of nitrogen in the leaf has a very, very strong correlation with its photosynthetic ability. So the more nitrogen the leaf has, the more it can photosynthesize, the more the plants can, the faster the plant can grow, the, the bigger it can get, the more light it can get, the better, the better the plant is. But plants have a, a very low relative amount of nitrogen predominantly carbon, if you look at the C to N ratio in a plant, it could be anywhere from maybe a 50 to 100 and a 100 to 1. Very, very small amount of nitrogen relative to a large amount of carbon. They can fix carbon by, through photosynthesis, but they cannot fix nitrogen atmospheric nitrogen. They get sun through some of the other bacteria and things like that. But nit so nitrogen is essential, but it's also very frequently a limiting resource. So we've got within a, within a forest system or in a terrestrial system a very clear cycling of nitrogen. So it's incorporated into the leaves, the leaves fall, it's broken down by the leaf material, the organic material lands on the bottom of the floor. It's broken down through decomposition and mineralization, and then later it's taken back up through. The, the plant's roots, through the tree's roots, and assimilated back up into the leaves. So it's constantly cycling through, through the system. And this, this cycling has two key components. The first is the photosynthesis, <coughs> draws it in. And second is decomposition. And when we're, we're for, for today, we're particularly interested in the nutrients were particularly interested in how plants and animals get their, their the nutrients, how the nutrients get in to feed the base of the food web. So for this, we need to focus on the second of these components, particularly on decomposition. At the, the base, at the basic level, decomposition is that the breaking of chemical bonds formed during the construction of plant and animal tissue. When we talked about, when we were talking about the previous sector about energy, we talked about, about entropy and how it requires energy to, to structure, to bring structure to a, to a system. As things are decomposed, what's happening is that structure is breaking down. The chemical bonds are broken down. And during this, it releases the energy, which was originally fixed through photosynthesis, quite often released as, as heat energy. Anybody has a compost bin in their, in their in the backyard, you'll know that, that, as that it's a warmer environment because of all the activity that's going on in there. That's heat energy, latent heat energy, being released during decomposition. It releases carbon dioxide and also water through res respiration by microorganisms and, and invertebrates and larger organisms within that, within that matrix. And over time, larger compounds are broken down to, or converted, into inorganic mineral nutrients. And it's that process of mineralization to create those inorganic minerals that can then be assimilated back into other organisms, other plants. It happens through a variety of different phases and different methods. We've got leaching, where <coughs> 
simply water soluble minerals are, are removed. Fragmentation and changes to the chemical and physical structure as the, the matrix or the, the substrate is broken down into, into smaller pieces. And also at a, at a biological level, through the ingestion by, by, by decomposers or by, by consumers, and the excretion of those wastes. And this continues cyclically until the material is entirely mineralized, until the material has been entirely broken down. There's a whole host of large and small organisms which, which do this. We can think of and bacteria and fungi, which are termed as decomposers. They don't directly consume the, uh, the material, but they'll release enzymes onto the, onto the material to break it down and then consume nutrients or consume minerals from that. Also detritivores, which are animals which specifically feed on dead material. We've got a whole host of different which go around and actually forage on the dead material and assimilate nutrients from it. We'll talk, it later, we'll talk a bit more later on about which do this, and we've got different, different forms of aquatic invertebrates sort of adapted to feeding on different types of dead material, depending on, on what's available in their environment. There is, but what happens to, to this dead material? There's a process that it goes through. If we can think of this sort of idea of <coughs> leaves, it's, it's, it's the right time of year to think about it. A, a cluster of leaves fall from a tree, land on the ground, start to decompose. What happens? There's two stages, there's two, two phases. First of all, we've got mineralization. That's the process through which the microbial decomposers convert nitrogen and other minerals to elements within the, within the, the matrix into organic compounds. Oh, sorry, they are organic compounds. They're converted into inorganic materials, inorganic nutrients, which can be assimilated by other plants. There's also, though, immobilization, which is the uptake of those nutrients by these decomposers. So some of those nutrients are taken up into the tissue of the, of the decomposer, of the organism. And we've got then a net mineralization rate, which is the, essentially one of these might be less than the other. So we've got the total amount of mineralization minus the amount that's being immobilized by the, by the decomposers. And we can track how this occurs, how nitrogen or different nutrients are released from that big body of leaves. This is a plot from the textbook. On the y-axis here, we've got the amount of a percent of the original nitrogen. So we start off at 100%. All of that, that leaf, that cluster of leaves, <coughs> drops to the ground. At time zero, it contains all, that, all of that nitrogen. We want to watch and observe what happens to this over time. First of all, we see a very fast, a pretty slow decrease in the amount of nitrogen due to leaching. So water is put in the rainbow, falls on these leaves, we leach it out some of that active or available nitrogen very quickly. Then an interesting the amount of nitrogen increases over time as mobilization exceeds mineralization. So that leaf, that leaf pack is now being colonized by lots of different decomposers and microorganisms, larger organisms, and they're breaking down or starting to break down that nitrogen. So they're assimilating that nitrogen into their own tissue. So we've got an increase, a net increase in the amount of nitrogen in, within this leaf pack because new organisms have moved in, they're growing, getting larger. We're increasing the amount of nitrogen within that system. 
over time, the decomposition continues, they start to use up that nitrogen, the end becomes limited. Or they even they run out of carbon, they run out of carbon or something else, they hit another limiting factor. In this instance, it's probably readily available carbon. And at that point, the mobilization starts to decrease. The amount of decomposers, the, bio, the biomass of decomposers decreases, and we've got an increased mineralization. The relative amount of mineralization is higher, and that allows that nitrogen then to be released from the system. And uptake, it's not gone, it, but it's been up, taken back up by, by other plants, so back up into to trees roots. So we can sort of plot this through a through a season that we're sort of just about reaching this point here where leaves are falling. Early winter, we need to hit a really active period of very active decay. And then late later winter, fewer invertebrates or fewer lower biomass of decomposers, but more nutrients become available. And as those plants start to, as we move into the spring, those plants start to photosynthesize again, start to become more active again. We're then drawing that nitrogen back up into, into their tissues. We see very similar plots for not only for nitrogen, but for other essential nutrients, essential limiting nutrients. Things like sulfur, calcium, magnesium, or manganese, sorry, which are required for plant growth, present in in leaves present in decomposing material, but read quite quickly, generally over time, are released through decomposition. So plants need nutrients. They get their nutrients through decomposition of organic material. We know that, that, so that's a really important process, but it's not stable. And we know that it's influenced by a variety of different things. It can be influenced by the quality of the material that, that's, that falls. Again, we can sort of use this analogy of a compost bin. A compost bin. Here we've got a nice big diversity of different types of plants that are full of different types of nutrients. Breaks down very rapidly, they're easily broken down. Breaks down to a nice diverse type of a compost, not so very so If that was all woody tissue, it wouldn't break down the same way. Eventually it will break down and those nutrients will be released, but it'll take a lot longer, it won't be as good a quality. It's also determined by our climate, by the, the rate, of, by the, by the Temperature and precipitation. In turn, they determine what types of organisms and what kind of microorganisms can live in an area. And that, in turn, will determine the, the rate at which tissues are broken down and material is broken down. Remember, quite a while ago now, we talked about different terrestrial biomes, and we went and we sort of looked at that sort of subarctic, boreal Arctic biome, where there's very little productivity. And one of the reasons there's very little productivity is because it's so cold and wet that there's um, decomposition occurs very, very slowly. So there's very few nutrients available for, for plant growth the following year, or follow during a brief summer. We can look at this in a bit more detail. And this again is a figure taken from the book. And what we're looking at here is on the y-axis, the amount of carbon that remains in a tissue. We sort of run again with this idea of a, of a, of a leaf plot, of a leaf plot. As we look at that over, over time, different components break down more rapidly. So things like simple sugars, glucoses, very rapidly metabolize. They make a small proportion of the overall leaf fat, so they're very, very easy to decompose. They're very easy for other organisms to reassemble. So they're very, very quickly broken down. 
slightly more complex materials like cellulose, hemicellulose, break down more slowly. And eventually, things like lignin, large, complex molecules, which not all microorganisms can break down, they will break down very, very slowly and ultimately may and will still be there after several months. So the type of material that's, that's there determines how quickly it breaks down. Think if you were to leave a, we're going for a long weekend, if I was to leave a banana there, with a piece of wood, a piece of bark, and come back here on Monday morning, one of those would have already decomposed quite a bit. One of them won't. One of them is made of a lot of metabolically available sugars and things like that. One of them is made of, of lignin, which is very difficult to break down. Lignin and cellulose, which is very difficult to break down. It's also influenced by, by temperature and moisture. So we can sort of take an example of this. Here we've got leaf wax, series of leaf wax, which are let, put outside and left to break down and decompose over, over a year. We do the same system, but in New Hampshire, Virginia, West Virginia, we over a year, come back, and come back over time and measure the, the dry mass. What we do is we're measuring the, the amount of material from, from the original product to, to, to the measure. And you can see that it breaks down far quicker in certain regions than others. Warmer, moister areas like Virginia breaks down far faster than it does up in New, New Hampshire. The same thing is true in, in aquatic environments. The same only well, slightly different. Aquatic environments have a host of different characteristics that are different to, to a terrestrial environment and influence decomposition. First of all, primary producers are very, there's a, two sort of different pools of primary producers. You can have things like phytoplankton, which grow within the, within, within the lake, or algae, which grow within the aquatic environment, or vascular plants, which could be runoff from or introduced from a terrestrial biome, or or macrophytes, say, which are growing in, a, on, in, an, in an aquatic environment. They're two very different compositions, two very different amounts of cellulose, different qualities, break down at different times. Other cycles break down very quickly. In addition, the decomposition is dependent on oxygen, on the availability of oxygen. Remember, when we were talking about respiration, we talked a bit about how uh, through, de through respiration and decomposition, CO2 is released and water is released. If oxygen is limited, the amount of respiration which can occur, the amount of biological activity which can occur is also reduced. And this is crucial in particularly anoxic, very, very low oxygen levels of water, things like, um, like, like marsh. And here we see very, very slow, low levels of decomposition. And we talked about the, the decomposers. Bacteria and fungi were sort of the two key groups. Well, bacteria cannot decompose lignin. They cannot break down lignin. And, ox and fungi require oxygen. So if we've moved into an, an anoxic environment, we've got very, very slow decomposition. Because the only groups that can decompose are a few populations or a few species of anaerobic bacteria. So this is why if we go to a marshland, we will see very, very slow decomposition. Things are very, very well preserved. In sort of a similar effect in a coastal environment, where decomposition is faster in totally submerged areas around the bank than it is at a, at a high marshal. So think of this as marshland in the Bay of Fundy. So you've got areas which are occasionally inundated, occasionally 
flooded by the salt, salt water, and, and that then that will seep. That's a, a difficult environment, a heterogeneous environment for a plant to live, for an organism to live. So there's fewer <coughs> species that can decompose in that environment, slower decomposition in a in the, in a high marshland than there is in a purely aquatic or pur purely terrestrial environment. In, as we move sort of out into a more open water system, we're going to think of this as either a, a large lake or, a, or an oceanic system. It's quite a different, or we've got a unique or a characteristic decomposition process. The majority of primary production occurs close to the water surface. That material dip falls down. And as it descends, as it descends, this organic material is being ingested, digested, and mineralized by, by zooplankton and other aquatic organisms, organisms which in turn will feed on the zooplankton, take those resources, ingest, assimilate some of the, the zooplankton, Excrete the rest, some of that is mineralized, fed on by other zooplankton. There's a pelagic rain moving down from the, from the ocean surface towards the ocean bed, and that's constantly being turned over. In a terrestrial system, there's a direct route for those resources, those nutrients, to be transported back up to the top of the system. You can see those nutrients sort of come down, and it's not mineralized, and it's brought back down, brought back up into the energy <coughs> range. That's less frequent in a, an aquatic system, or certainly in an open water system. We've got some instances in a shallow lake, and may have some macrophytes or aquatic plants that can bring those nutrients back up. Otherwise, for the most part, there's productivity at the, at the surface, and it rains down to the, to the lake bed or the sea bed. We talked a bit in a previous lecture about what happens or what can happen about stratification within, within lakes. As lakes heat, a quick recap, as lake heat, as lakes heat, they, we can get stratification whereby there's an epilimnium surface layer, which is warm, where all the productivity occurs. Hypolimnium, a co cooler zone, <clears throat> lower in the lake, lower water, less productivity. In the epilimnium, it's where we've got a lot of the our mobilization is greater than mineralization. We've got more organisms there assimilating new elements. As we move down to hypolimnium, we've got the, the alternate case. The mobilization is lower than mineralization. At the end of a at the end of a summer, it ends up in a situation where we've got all the nutrients which have been mineralized are down close to the lake bed. We then move into one of these lake turnover cycles, and that brings those nutrients, allows those nutrients to be mixed back up in, into, into the water. And we see, oh, yeah. we see some characteristic things here. Okay? So this is sort of lake resource availability in terms of nutrients and life. As we move into the spring, we hit this key point in the spring as, as ice melts in this instance, or in the fall as stratification breaks down. We hit this key point where there's a lot of nutrients and there's also a lot of life. And that stimulates that initial product pulse of productivity here when these two things overlap. We can get a secondary pulse of productivity associated with the fall breakdown in lakes which stratify. 
It's worth also noting that there's a lot of instances, a lot of locations where lakes don't stratify. It's just as a subarctic environment or even as atmospheric, where because there's no barriers to wind, you've got very high, very strong winds, and that keeps the majority of lakes mixed, keeps the water mixed right throughout the year. So rather than having this seasonal dip in nutrient availability, the nutrients <coughs> remain stable right throughout the year because that lake is constantly mixed, and that productivity occurs right throughout the year. It's matches month. And again, it gets back to the limiting factors. Nutrients are available throughout the year. Only when light is also available do we see productivity. When light is less available, even if nutrients are still available, lower productivity. In a river system, we've got a different variant on that again. You go to a river, pick up some rocks, you'll feel sort of it's, uh, most people should, uh, certainly if you don't, you should. And this had picked it, gone and picked up a rock from a river and felt that it feels kind of slimy. Yeah? That slimy layer is what we call biofilm. And it's a heterogeneous mix of algae bacteria, and fungi. And it's the base of the area of most river fever. It's these organisms working together to form a, to, to release nutrients, and to create a nutrient resource for, for other consumers. Algae are constantly taking up dissolved organic matter and also releasing, or, photosynthetic products. Bacteria are releasing micronutrients that are breaking down on the work, break, working to break down these algae, releasing CO2, releasing different enzymes. Fungi are structurally getting in, breaking up the structure, and releasing small particulate organic matter. The three of these together interacting to create a, a nutrient matrix which essentially takes in it's a decomposition and nutrient release within one system. And they create the basis, that's the basis for most stream food webs. It's the basis for what we talked about in the previous <coughs> episode about the, about the North River continual concept. If we look at different areas of the river, we see different types of invertebrates. At the, 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 the upper reaches, we've got shredders, large aquatic or some aquatic arthropods which are adapted to breaking down plant material, structurally breaking it down. And there's a, it's still a bit of an ongoing debate as to what are they actually feeding on. Are they feeding on the plant material that they break down, or are they feeding on the far more readily available, the far more nutritious biofilms and algae that are growing on, the, on that plant material. As we move further downstream, we've got more filter feeding invertebrates. Invertebrates which are capturing organisms, are capturing particulate organic matter from the, from the water column. And then finally, as we move down towards a uh, the mouth of the river or into a larger bed, even somewhere like the, the St. John River here in Fredericton, we've got more grazers and scrapers, organisms and snails that are moving along and actually stop feeding off the biofilm that's growing on, on the lake bed or the stream bed. In the interest of time, we're going to zip past that. We talked about a nutrient cycle through a, through a terrestrial environment where they're brought, brought up, transported up through the roots and fall down with the leaves. In a lake environment where they fall down 
percolate down, work their way down through a through the water column. And occasionally, we'll get remixed by uh, the, the breakdown break of thermoclines, in lakes at least. It's slightly more complicated in, in rivers because in addition to that temporal cycle, there's also a spatial component due to the water as the water moves. And we can sort of think of this as, as spirals rather than, rather than a pure circle. These are moving spatially as well. And this is really important for how river food webs function because it's the, any breakdown, the, it's the length of that spiral that determines the amount of resources that are available. The shorter that spiral is, the faster resources are being moved through the, through the system. The longer that spiral is, the longer it takes for resources to move through the system. And things such as impoundments, such as on, on tree branches, such as even orga or organisms that kill the species, that disrupt the flow of water, disrupt that spiral, and create, can create nutrient pools within, within a river. As the river moves to, moves to the sea, we move into another, a very, another very different type of environment, the sort of marine coastal shoreline environment. The river's velocity drops, all its sediment is deposited, and this sediment builds up as large alluvial plains, which are dominated by, by different types of grasses. As we sort of discussed earlier, or mentioned earlier, this is a very difficult area for, for decomposition. Decomposition occurs very slowly here. It's one of the reasons that floodplains are excellent areas or are very fertile areas for agriculture, because there's a lot of nutrients that come down, are deposited, or break down or are reassimilated very slowly. And some components of this are similar to terrestrial environments, and other components are more similar to, to aquatic environments. We've got dominant plants, or even some submerged plants, which take up nutrients from the soil and return those nutrients from, with their, as, they, as they drop their leaves. There's also a, a directional flow of material within this environment, either through the, through the tides or through, through uh, there's still some flow in the river. So there's risen, so these nutrients are constantly being, being moved around uh, moved around the system. And the material is being moved around the system. As we go a little further and sort of move out to sea, we get another what we can see as almost a proxy of the of the thermocline. We determine as the and essentially what we're seeing here is low density fresh water meeting high density salt water. And the higher density water, or the lower density water, flows above the higher density water. They don't purely mix, we have an overlap. And it's, it's considered like a, a salt wedge at the base of a, at the base of an entity. And this means that nutrients that come down to the river percolate out, land in this saltwater wedge, and are then returned back with, with the tides back towards the river bed. So we've got another cycling of nutrients within. <coughs> and again, that's a reason that estuaries are extremely productive, because we've got when nutrients are come, come out. They're constantly being turned over and brought back in towards the river, brought back out again, turned over and brought back in. And within that plume, those within that organic material plume, there's a host of plankton, bacteria, vertebrates, fishes that are breaking down and reusing those, those materials, those organisms, or that, those nutrients. We're going to blow this out onto a global scale. 
is that that pattern sort of breaks down once we move maybe 100, 200 meters offshore. And at that point, the fresh water and the marine and the seawater is well mixed. And the movement of water, the movement of nutrients, is determined at the start of the course by the Coriolis. This is a really interesting interaction with the productivity pathways in the, in the marine system, which we talked about previously as being kind of a unidirectional system. Productivity at the ocean surface, nutrients fall down over time, are reused, and reassimilated, they can go down, but constantly work their way down. The surface waters around the equator have been put, constantly pushed to the west. There's a counter current below those as, as, as they cycle around, which moves in the opposite direction towards the east. And that brings large amounts of nutrients that are percolated down <coughs> back and creates these upwelling zones along the west coast of the Americas, also on, on, the, on the west Arctic, even in the so these cycles, these, these global movements of water, which you talked about as distributing heat around the globe, are also a global scale where the patterns that are distributing nutrients around the ocean and determine why we have these really rich fisheries along the, the west coast of the Americas and the west coast of Africa that support massive, massive populations of plankton and fish which support a variety of different predatory fish and support large human populations. We're going to talk a bit more about that in the, in the next lecture. We're going to talk about biogeochemistry and how we can use sort of chemical traces to, to map these patterns. That would be sort of the end of my dedicated lecture slot, but we still have that sort of some Wednesday, we still have that revision slot to stay next week. So if there are areas that you want specifically want to cover, send me an email, come and talk to me. This is your opportunity to do it. Okay? Have a nice Thanksgiving, have a nice weekend, and I'll see you all on Wednesday.